Today on the IT show, we're going to talk about AI on the edge. So really like artificial intelligence running on very tiny devices. And I have Chris Lovett with me from Microsoft Research to go into details into a fantastic project called L. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Internet of Things show. I'm Olivier, your host. Today we have Chris with us, Chris Lovett. Nice to, nice to see you, nice to have you on the show, Chris. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah. And today you're going to talk about that, AI on the edge, right? Yes. You're, you're ready for it. I am. Awesome. AI on, AI on the edge. So AI on the edge, what is it about? So it's happening, it's a big deal. And you're seeing an explosion of IoT devices across the planet. Yeah. People are predicting 50 billion IoT devices by 2020. They are. Out there doing work in the real world. Yep. Intel uh, CEO had a good way of talking about it. Computers are leaving the confines of their PCs and mm -hmm. exploring the world. Okay. And so you get all of these tiny little devices. I have millions of them on the table here. Little tiny things from TI. Yep. Out there with loaded with sensors, and mm -hmm. they can sense the world. So. Yep. What's interesting is what you're showing here is a set of, uh, of devices of different sizes, different capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, when we say IoT at the edge, or AI at the edge, sorry, yep. um, what people, and sometimes what we also you know, say and talk about is Azure IoT Edge. But here, we're talk to, we are here to talk about a bit more than just Azure IoT Edge, which is a runtime to run uh, you know, technologies from the cloud or machine learning models or whatever down mm -hmm. on Devices are capable of running Docker, but in your case, you're extending that notion of running AI on the edge to more than just these beefy OS-based devices. That's right. We're talking about tinier ones, right? That's right, and I'm going to show some demos of that uh, here today. Yeah. So you're part of Microsoft Research? That's right. Why? And, and <laughs> what exactly are you focusing your research on to AI on the edge? But right. like more, more generally, uh, and, and there's a context of IoT, uh, but are there specific things you focus on in terms of, of you know, compilers versus OS technologies versus they're like disciplines that you're looking into? Sure. Well, uh, speaking for me personally, I've been in Microsoft product teams for about 20 years and decided to join MSR two years ago, okay, because uh, I wanted to think further out into the future and sort of start breaking the barriers of, of innovation at Microsoft. MSR, I've always worked with MSR from yeah. product groups, yeah. so it's really great to actually be inside MSR finally. <laughs> and uh, they do the whole spectrum of research on AI. Okay, right. They do everything from algorithms, developing new AI techniques, mm -hmm. new training algorithms, all the way through to what I'm doing is on the other end, which is how small can we squeeze the runtime for uh, doing AI inference, can we make it run on tiny devices? Okay. So we're building a compiler to do that, and okay. that's what I'll talk about okay. here. Okay. I think I have a... Let's jump into it. So we all know that AI starts with modeling yeah. uh, training, right? Yes. So you've got to build a model, and you've got to train a model that usually takes massive amounts of data. Yep. It usually takes really big iron. We use NVIDIA CUDA mm -hmm. GPUs. I have a 1080 GPU on my desktop, and I can train some models there. But <laughs> even then, yeah. to do a million image uh, model mm -hmm. uh, based on the ImageNet data set would take me weeks and weeks, right? So yeah. we use the cloud, we use Azure, yep. and uh, we train the models up there. So the uh, project I'm going to talk about isn't focused on training. Okay. Right? We assume you do your training. Yep. Uh, maybe you get a, a pre-trained your okay. network, and now you want to put it on your tiny device. Okay. We also have this explosion of IoT that's happening, and I have a spectrum here on the picture with yep. um, phones all the way down to Raspberry Pi, down to Pi Zero, down to Cortex M class chips, mm -hmm. M7, M4, M0. Okay. Uh, I actually have an M0 here somewhere. Um, <laughs> you, you can't find it. <laughs> it's too little. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the spectrum we're focused on is this low end. We think of a smartphone as a supercomputer in, in our world, right? So, yep. yeah, sure, you can do AI on the phone. It has pretty good uh, DSP processors there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, down at the Cortex-M0 level, if you look at the scale across the bottom of DMIPS, yep. it's a thousand times less powerful than, than, your, mm -hmm. than your average phone. But if you have 50 billion of these devices, right? Yes. That's still a lot of compute power. It is. Even if you divide by 1,000, it's still a big number. Yep, yep, agreed. Right? Let's not waste all that mm -hmm. you know, CPU power. Let's actually put it to work. Yep. Right? So that's what we'll do. That's where L comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're a neural network compiler. Okay. L stands for Embedded Learning Library. 
Okay. It's actually up on GitHub. I'll show you the link. Nice. You take your trained model. That's a picture of a, a trained model there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using a really cool tool called Netron. Uh, okay. And uh, to visualize your mm -hmm. neural network. Okay. But these are big, right? And we import it. So Onyx is a standard that is uh, for exchanging neural networks okay. in a standard format. Right? Okay. You don't wanna, you know, I don't want to build a compiler and have to understand PyTorch and CNTK and TensorFlow and all the other new ones mm -hmm. that come out. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to have this standard in place. So okay. that, and that, you say a standard as in big companies like Microsoft, yep. Facebook, are working together and defining what Onyx is. That's right. Okay. Yep. So, so basically, and you mentioned tons of technologies, like tons of neural network technologies, like TensorFlow and so yeah. that are well known out there. That's right. All of these, we would expect some point to converge towards Onyx, or it's just an export format that then you can leverage to do something else like Unix. Well, say. it's an export format. They yeah. don't need to be <coughs> limited necessarily by that format, right? You know, standards don't necessarily go as fast as, as one product wants to innovate. Yeah, yeah, so they yeah, may yeah. have a few extra things here that you can't do through Onyx. Mm -hmm. Onyx will, you know, is moving quickly though. You know, okay. they're, they're actually yeah, yeah. Ca catching up really fast. It's it's a it's a pretty easy format to extend, uh, so I think they've already thought about how to do that, okay. which is exciting. So for that's perfect for for us. That's what we want to see. We take that and we pump it into the L compiler, okay. and you get code. We actually compile the neural network down to machine code. Machine code, not machine code, code as in like like yeah, C sharp no, as well. No, no, no. We don't generate like we don't generate code. We generate object code. Yeah. Yeah. It'll execute on the target device yeah. that you specify. Yeah, and needs to be optimized, right? It yeah, so be... we need to know what that target device can do. Mm -hmm. So we know how to optimize the neural network. We know how much to shrink it down to make it fit, okay. that, that sort of thing. So that's where L comes in. Okay. How long have you been working on that project? Because it seems, it seems like a huge amount of work. It is, actually. Okay. I've been on the project for about a year. There's other people uh, that have been on the project for longer. The brainchild, you know, this is the brainchild of uh, our principal researcher, Ofa Dekel. Okay. He's been working on it for two years, I think, okay. or more. Okay. Um, and and it's going to be interesting to see how the community reacts and actually starts contributing or working with you guys, if not already the case, right? Because that's, that's an right. open source project. That's right. And hopefully you're going to advertise that a little here. Yep, yep. I think I have a slide right oh, I'm glad there you go. asked. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> L is it was not planned. <laughs> <laughs> L is an open source project. It's cross-platform. Um, C++, uh, standard 17. Okay. So totally cross-platform C++. We actually, uh, the compiler runs on Windows and Linux and Mac OS. Okay. Right? So you can yeah. develop on mm -hmm. whatever platform you want as mm -hmm. a dev. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is built on the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which okay. is another big mm -hmm. open source project. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, Ophidekel is the principal behind this. Okay. There's a link right there. Uh, so you can go actually up to GitHub. Yep. Uh, Microsoft GitHub slash L. We okay. actually have the code up there as well, so you can find that. Okay. We also have tutorials. Nice. And you can get started, you know, jump in with a Raspberry Pi, and, and pretty soon if you follow this tutorial, you'll have something recognizing pictures. Nice. Right, this is doing classification okay. here, and so on. I uh, play with that. I highly recommend people go check it out. Um, but as I said, uh, it's open source, meaning, you know, if you find a bug, you know, help us fix yep. it. If there's some Onyx layer that's missing, help us implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to see some more community you know, participation because yep. uh, it is, like you said, it's a big project. Yep. We also have a gallery up there. So we have pre-trained images. We actually have ImageNet uh, models that we've trained. Okay. And we train this using our in-house GPU cluster. Right? Mm -hmm. so, and we've got models that vary on speed versus accuracy. So when you're planning to run on these tiny devices and you've got limited resources, you yep, need yep. to figure out where on that curve you need to be. Mm -hmm. right? If you, you know, can live with 500 milliseconds, then you pick that model. But if one second is just too slow for your application, right, this curve then helps yep, you, yep. you find it. So uh, uh, the job for you know, these AI researchers then is to push this curve all the time. Mm -hmm. right? And we've done that in the, in the last year of training that we've done. We've continually pushed this curve up, okay. and, up and up and up and up. But that's on the training side of things, right? That's still on the training oh, okay. side. That's right. Well, that's going to help actually making these binary images smaller as that's well, right? right? Yeah, yeah. That's, there, that's there's, there's a dovetail there, right? Okay. You, you, it's definitely a, a process. So let's, you know, that's enough slides. I'm not a yes. PM, so I can't do any more slides. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Sorry, are you a PM? <laughs> I mean, between. <laughs> Time for demo and uh, some code. So uh, the demo I want to focus on is about um, the problem of figuring out meeting room occupancy. So people counting in meeting rooms mm -hmm. where you want to get an idea across the whole enterprise, how's the space being utilized? Yes. 
right? Do we have enough meeting rooms? Very Does concrete. this building need yeah. another one? Do we, mm -hmm. you know, do we have, um, are they under, underutilized, right? Or are they the wrong mm. size, right? Yeah. Maybe the rooms, this giant room's always got five people in it. Yeah. Or should I tune down the AC or, or yeah, the, yeah. the heating? Because when too. you have a full room, small, yeah. like tiny room full of people, you don't need that much heating in that room, That's right? right? That's right. Yep. So people have tried to do this with low-tech devices, you know, a little, you know, IR sensor on the door that counts people going in and counts people leaving. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those in packing garages? Yeah. They never work. <laughs> They're trying to do something, but then there's a situation that happens that is not planned ahead of time. Right. And the count Definitely. gets off, yep. and now you've got bogus data. Yep, yep. So sometimes the simplest is not the best. <laughs> so if you had an AI model that could count people, <clears throat> yep. and you could run it on a cheap device, yep. then why not do it? So yep. And you say cheap, but it's also eventually scenarios where you would be running on battery or potentially this kind of things as That's well, right. right? It's not just the price of the device itself; is right. where it's going to be located, how many of them you're going to have? Because if you multiply a number of devices, That's right. you have to go cheaper right. to afford it. That's right. Totally. Now we could do this with um, streaming all the video to Azure, right? But then you got privacy problems, you yep. got security problems, you've mm -hmm. got uh, massive bandwidth, yep. you know, usage. You got massive Azure compute on the back end that needs mm -hmm, to, you, mm -hmm. know, contain, you know, take all those streams. Yep. It's actually much more efficient if you can do this at the camera. Yes. And that solves a privacy problem. So the only thing you're sending to Azure now is just the count. Yeah, number of right? people. And yeah. presumably people will be okay with that. So we took this model. This came from Microsoft Research in Asia. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. actually trained, they designed the model architecture for this okay. problem. Okay. This is not just a face detector. It's a people detector. Okay. Right? And uh, they had this big model, and they were using you know big GPUs and and you know the, the 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 interesting thing is that when you use TensorFlow and C and K and PyTorch and these big training systems, then they're great for training. Yeah. They can use up a GPU. Mm -hmm. They can use up two GPUs, <laughs> right? And they can just yep. pummel that thing. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're designed for. Mm -hmm. They're not designed for shrinking it down and running it on a tiny device. Mm -hmm. So you know this device here. The Azure IoT Dev Kit, that's never going to run TensorFlow. It's, it's, it's too small. It's too small, right? yep. And so taking this big model, they, they were running their you know, demo on a big you know, 1080 you know, Ti NVIDIA GPU. OK. Right? And it looked great. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, well, can we make it run on a Raspberry Pi? And <laughs> so our first Oops. attempt, you know, 30 seconds per frame, it's like, oh, OK. It's not going to cut it. So yeah. we did some work on training and mm -hmm. pruning, and, and, okay. uh, and we, we pulled the image down, you know, pulled it down and down, and eventually we could get it to fit on a Pi. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you sacrifice frame rate, so it's not going to be real time. But okay. this video here shows that it's you know, maybe once every second. Yeah. You're getting an update on that people count. Decent enough for the people count. Definitely. That's right. Yep. And in fact, I have that running right here on this Raspberry Pi in front yep. of you. And That'd be yep, me, right? yep, there it's detected you. And twice. I oh, count oh, twice. Yeah. <laughs> on the I'm, screen. I'm two. <laughs> uh -oh. We've cloned him. Oh, <laughs> hell. <laughs> that's what totally AI fun. on the edge does. It clones people. <laughs> that's right. So that's proof you know, that it actually works. Yeah, totally. Um, and that's actually streaming as well. So that's, that accounts for some of the uh, overhead because it's encoding yeah. video yeah. and, and mm. doing. E now, you wouldn't Still. do that if you, if you wanted this to be headless. You would just send the number. To yes. Azure, you wouldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. bother and, streaming and still the like, video. Yeah, and it's streaming the video and so on, but like, like working on videos is definitely not an easy task in general, right? Right, right. All right, so let's build this. Okay. Let's uh, talk about, dive, that, dive down a little deeper. This is the Raspberry Pi camera module that mm -hmm. you can get for Raspberry Pi. It works really well. Yeah. And as I said, you can stream all the video to Azure, but it's way, way cheaper to just stream a number. Yes. Right, so that's Agreed. what we're going to try and achieve Agreed. here. And the code then, let's take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you have the camera. We actually use OpenCV to read the camera. Mm -hmm. They have a nice little library for uh, yeah. doing video. Another open source framework? Yep, that's Love right. Yeah. Yep, yep. And then we run that through the compiled L you know, predictor. Mm -hmm. right? So we just pass the OpenCV you know, NumPy array, actually. Right? We convert okay. that to a buffer of floating point numbers. We pass that into predictor. Mm -hmm. And we get back. Um, both the region boxes of where the people are, and, okay. and which we can then count and count the number of okay. people. Um, and then we can send that count to Azure. So okay. the, key, the key point is what you get from L mm -hmm. is just a super simple API. And you can look at it in C, which is just model predict. <laughs> and you pass in, you like. know, actually, I double, doubles are the input in this case. Okay. And, then you, and then you get floats. <clears throat> Okay. We have a C++ wrapper on that. Of course, if you want to do the nice standard vector, okay. you know, blah, 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 and you okay. get that. We even uh, put a Python wrapper around the L module. So yep. you can, we compile 
um, both the predictor, the neural network, and mm. we wrap it in the Python okay. wrappers so you can actually call this from Python. Because Python, why not? Why not? Yeah. Everyone well, but loves people Python. use it. Lots of people use it in AI, actually. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. yeah, very much. But it's a very thin wrapper, so you're not really spending any time in Python. It's, it's all of the uh, CPU power is going yes. into straight machine, you know, machine code, optimized. Mm -hmm. So that's what that looks like. And I can show that in VS Code. Nice. So here's VS Code. OK. And um, there's the predict call. <laughs> it's almost boring, one line of code. That's it. Like <laughs> you know? All that magic happening behind the scenes yeah. inside the model, but as an app developer, <coughs> hooking it up is just get an API basically to simple. leverage your your. Interestingly, actually, when you think about cognitive services in Azure, right. for a developer, it's an API call. That's right. The fact that it happens somewhere else, you know, is is, is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. In that case, you are developing on your device. Yep. It happens on the device, and it's also an API call. So we're That's pretty right. much in the same configuration here. Yep, I think so. Yeah. In fact, you bring up a great point. Mm -hmm. I think there is also a fantastic story to be had around creating a hybrid system mm -hmm. that does local AI mm -hmm. with a cheap, small model yep. that gives you a heads up that something interesting might be happening in the scene. Mm -hmm. Then you send that to the cloud for yeah. processing on a much bigger model. So instead of, instead of permanently or, 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 or systematically sending everything, mm -hmm. you detect a problem using that simple model, mm -hmm. and then say, oh, there's an anomaly. So now it's time to do the hardcore analytics on a buffer of x yep. seconds of video for the case of a video, whatever right. amount of data. Yeah, exactly. Makes sense. And you know, yep, it could yep. just be an accuracy thing. It, it could just be that the local model is 50% accurate, and the cloud model is 99% accurate. Yep. Right. Yep. And and you're trading off that accuracy yep. for uh, yep. efficiency, and you're reducing the cost on the cloud because yep. you're not constantly streaming stuff. Like that, so. And you make me think about a scenario, which is um, there's the redu reduction of the cost for the streaming, but also there's the non permanently connected scenario where eventually your device like is driving under a tunnel or yeah. is losing connection. Right. You cannot actually rely on uh, yep. on, a, on, a so on a resource which is not local. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah, we have AI happening out in farms and stuff like that mm -hmm. where you just don't have the connectivity, and, yep. and having this option, I think, is fantastic. So demo number two. OK. <laughs> <laughs> this time, I'm going to focus on audio. OK. So there is a ton of really interesting audio scenarios for a little device, a little cheap device that's always listening. Mm -hmm. And you can do simple keyword spotting. So yep. just imagine a mm -hmm. little interactive toy, and your kid can tell it to yep. do things, right? Yeah. And but a goodness, though, like you're saying, like a tiny device always listening to you. Yeah. Privacy again. Yep. Like we don't want like a big company to listen to us all the time, right? No, we don't. There's been a lot of controversy about yep. that yep. exact topic. There's been totally because of okay. devices that are in the home always yep. listening. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and you know, or you can just do simple activity detection. You can detect is the microwave running, the coffee machine's ready, the dishwasher's done, the freezer alarm is beeping, you know, and, and all of these make very distinct sounds. Yep. You can train models that recognize those sounds very easily. Mm -hmm. And you can put it on a tiny little device and slap them everywhere, right? We're gonna paint the planet with sensors that'll understand like that. what's happening in the environment. Yep. It'll give us these little events, right? Mm -hmm. These little sort of AI events. Yep. Um, anomaly detection uh, is the motor on the car sounding like it's not working right. And time for tuning is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I actually had a customer call us already. They want to put these sensors in a jet engine. Okay. Right? You know, does it sound, does it sound right? You yeah. Know? And if it's a $2 chip, you just slap them everywhere. It doesn't matter if it, it breaks yeah. after a year because it's so cheap, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's also inclusive design scenarios. So you've got somebody with, uh, that's deaf and they want to know, you know, is somebody at the front door? Is there somebody behind them calling their name? Is, sure. yeah. is the baby crying? You know, there's tons of, mm -hmm. there's just mm -hmm. an infinite number of these scenarios. All right, so I'm going to this time use the Azure IoT Dev Kit. Yep. And this is a really, <coughs> really great little board. Yep. Take a quick drink here. I'm, I'm just all emotional about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the uh, on the um, board, I'll I'll point out where the microphone is. It has um, little Cortex M4 32-bit processor. I'm running yep. at 100 megahertz. It's got mm -hmm. one meg flash to 56k RAM. That's the limit of your model, right? So yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to try and run a, a vision model on here. It doesn't have a camera hooked up. You know, it doesn't have enough memory but, for that. But that's interesting that you yeah. say that because that means like finally, I'm, I'm an embedded guy, right? Yeah. So finally, we're back to thinking about devices as something that has a limited amount of resources yep. and they can run a limited amount of things. Yep. Because we're in an era of like mobile devices and the cloud where you have infinite resources and can do whatever you want. Right. And so many times I'm seeing developers just assuming 
that they can do whatever they want. They don't deallocate the resources. Oh, yeah, just yeah. like all this kind of things. We've become out. lazy, right, as, yeah. as, as programmers. Yeah. You know? And now we're yeah. back to, okay, and we need to optimize. Then we need to consider the fact that we're not getting that like super powerful thing that you don't use any of the capacity for 99% of the time and just 1% of the time you use them. Yeah. So now we have like, okay, we have limited amount of resources. We're going to optimize the use. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use it for exactly what has been built, which is like using the full potential of that tiny thing, yep. rather than putting like a big, super powerful thing that you consumes yeah. a lot of energy for nothing. Exactly, and I think it's you know it's about utilizing those resources. Like I said, 50 billion of these things are going to be out there. Let's let's not waste yeah. that CPU power. Yeah. Let's put it to good work, uh, good use. Um, so I'm going to pick the keyword spotting scenario. So I found okay. this great uh, data set. It was actually crowdsourced by Google. Okay. And I have a link on. Uh, we have a link on our website to the data set. It contains okay. sixty thousand one-second recordings okay. of people speaking these thirty keywords. Okay. Know, up, down, left, right, one, two, three, four, so on. Simple ones. Simple keywords. The ones you would use at home for. Yeah. You know, little yeah. command and control type yeah. stuff. You know. I like it. Yep. And uh, it works off uh, the speech input through the microphone, so it's working off direct human, you know, mm -hmm. speech, and. Um, Let's take a closer look this time at yep. how we built this demo from, okay. you, know, you know, I kind of glossed over how much work went into making that work on the Pi. Yeah. So I'm going to show you that it's, this is an iterative process, mm -hmm. right? So I've got a list there of train, compile, test, oh dang, it doesn't work, you know, <laughs> fix, retrain, Real life. recompile, <laughs> test, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and we go through that iteration and I'll talk about that here okay. in, a, in a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. So we train the model. Mm -hmm. uh, now in the case of audio, it's a bit different from, from video. Uh, you can't just pump pixels straight into the model. You can't just pump the raw audio into the model because the information that's in an audio stream is actually in the frequency domain, mm -hmm. not just in the time domain. Okay. There's a lot of frequency information you have to extract from that mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. So we actually use a, f a frequency transform called MFCC. It's a okay. uh, transform on that input data that'll give you a frequency map of the data. In a way, it kind of turns the audio waveform that looks like this, right, yeah. into a picture. Mm. And we can train a model to recognize those pictures. Right? Okay. Okay. So in this case, we trained a two-layer GIU classifier. has mm -hmm. 128 hidden units. Mm -hmm. And we do use PyTorch. takes about eight minutes on my PC with an NVIDIA 1080. Okay. So that's great. I, ha I can do a really fast turnaround on these audio yep, models. Yep, yep. right? I don't have to wait weeks for that model to be trained. Makes sense. We get 98% training accuracy, about 91 test accuracy. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty happy with that. And the model in our first try uh, came out at about 900 KB. Okay. Which just fits on the one meg flash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I had just, to like just. remove yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. modules and <laughs> squeeze it in yep. there. Yep. But it did fit, you know, and yep. it was a little bit too slow, couldn't keep up with real time. Okay. So I'm like, dang, okay, so, you know, iteration number and two. And you want to do something else on the device as well. It has tons of sensors yeah. and so on. That's right, that's right, that's so, right. Yeah. You don't want to use up the entire CPU mm -hmm. just doing this. Um, so we have this, uh, this is the MFCC transform, and um, Unlike other systems, when, when you're training with PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever, they use big Python libraries mm -hmm. to do this transformation, yep. this uh, MEL frequency, mm -hmm. Capstrom coefficient transform. And LibRosa is one of them. They have a bunch of different libraries that people use. I don't have LibRosa on here, right? So uh, the really cool thing about L is I can build an L model that describes that transform as well as the classifier. Mm. Okay. okay, so these nodes in this picture here mm -hmm. are actually L nodes that the compiler understands. Got it. So the compiler knows yeah. how to compile FFT nodes and MEL filter banks and so on down to machine code. Mm -hmm. And this is my first model. This is a front-end model. Okay. So you can actually have in your application, you can have multiple models. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run this model. This will give me this uh, spectrogram okay. output, which mm -hmm. I'll pump into the classifier. So it'll be a two-stage process. Got it. Yeah. Very smart. So then we tr train the GRU classifier. It's actually a very simple model. It's still technically a deep neural network, but it mm -hmm. only contains two layers plus a fully connected layer. Okay. And I've actually thrown in an extra node I'll talk about here, the voice mm -hmm. activity detector. Mm -hmm. That was another key to making this work. Okay. So here's, here's all, the, all the tips and tricks. You know, Training uh, data that we had wasn't perfect because mm -hmm. it wasn't recorded with that microphone. Mm, so yeah, right? so frequency, the output yeah, is not the same. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. the training data is actually quite noisy because it was crowdsourced. Everybody had different headsets, and some okay. people were speaking right into mm -hmm. the mic, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually had to enable automat automatic um, leveling uh, volume control okay. on on that chip because there's a nice little audio codec chip that can do that. That's mm -hmm. actually also upboarding from the CPU, okay. which is great. 
we had to enable the Neon SIMD FPU to give uh, floating point vectorization. Okay. We got a nice eight times speed up there. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Now, at this point, you know, in making everything work, it's starting to look like this thing's going to work. Mm -hmm. so it's starting to get exciting. We switched sigmoid to hard sigmoid, which is a nice little mathematical trick where you approximate a very expensive math function mm -hmm. into something much cheaper. It okay. gives us another great speed up. Mm -hmm. Then we retrained the model. Initially, we were training it with 128 hidden units, and we, we squeezed it down to 80 uh, just to you know, lose a little bit of accuracy. But again, it's m much smaller. Yeah, this is where um, actually you this have this. This is an like, ex exponential yeah, change in this size. This is where right? you have to actually do your trade off That's on right. your charts that exactly. you were sh showing at the beginning, right? Exactly, exactly. And then one more thing is uh, the GIU is, is an RNN type model that actually has a history, it has a memory, it understands changes over time. So it's not just looking at that MEL spectrogram as a as a snapshot, it's looking at slices over time. Okay. And it's watching how it changes and it's, and it's reacting to mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. change because the shape of our words changes over time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it's learning to do, but when does it reset that state? And if you talk quickly in all those, all those commands and they all blur into each other, right? And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It's, and, and you want to actually, you need to be able to tell that GIU node when to throw away the history. And so the voice activity detector is a great way to do that. It can tell there's no activity and it resets the GIU. Mm -hmm. Now the GIU is ready for the next word. Got it. So these are all little tricks we learned. It took actually you know a couple of months to work through all of these yeah, details, yeah, yeah. but then finally you get a model. The goodness for people watching that you did the work <laughs> <laughs> and you're sharing what you found. This yes. is awesome. So let's take a look at that, and I have it right here. Yep. That sounds. Right. So That's yep. This little microscope. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I look at that, let's also point out these little components. That right there is the microphone. You can see little holes in it. Yep. And this is the audio codec chip that we're using to do some filtering and auto level control. Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five. Happy. Dog. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Now, what this isn't <coughs> trained for, this is just a keyword spotter. Okay. So you can see it's doing false positives when I start speaking random gibberish that it doesn't, it wasn't trained to understand. Okay. It right. tries to, it tries right. to have a, a, a match, but can't find it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Now you could train uh, again on a much bigger data set mm -hmm. with lots and lots of phrases, and that you would get rid of those false positives. Okay. Uh, but this was just a very simple data set. Okay. But it works. Yeah. It works. Yeah, it works. And I'll have the, the. I like the way actually when you were describing how you've been composing your models, your neural network, uh, yep. neural uh, network by by actually composing different of these models. Uh, makes me think of libraries when you're doing yeah. development for yeah. an application. Exactly. It's like it's exactly the same thing, right? Different is that you're training these libraries. Uh, based on data yep. up there in the cloud. And so that's exactly yeah. right. And what you see here is this is the audio code. And um, make this a little smaller so we can see the code. And I'm going to look for the predict function. Okay. Um, it's down here somewhere. There it is. So scrolling down. There we go. So there's the filter, the MFCC transform that I talked about. Mm -hmm. And you pass in the raw audio buffer there. Okay. You get out the featureized data, and now you can pass it into the classifier. Mm -hmm. So exactly right. You can see on the left here, there's a classifier dot o. Okay. And there's a featureizer, also actually dot s in this case. Dot s assembly. Uh, yeah. Assembly. Yeah. So you yeah. got vectorized machine code. You see all mm -hmm. the v instructions there. <laughs> yeah. That's the code you don't <laughs> want to write by hand. You know. Um, but it or runs. Not sure anyone really knows how to write it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but it runs really fast. Yeah. So, but that's your, that's the libraries you're talking about, right? So you get the featureizer library, you got the classifier mm -hmm. library. You just you get yeah, it, they get are it. indeed libraries. Yeah, at the end you, of the day, and, from and the you got a header file. Yeah. We actually spit out this header file for you to mm -hmm. tell you what the. It's not just predict. You can also get metadata about the model, like how many nodes, how many, you know, what's input size, output size, okay, stuff like that, and so. We already saw that, so we don't need to. Yep. No, don't need to, to pretend that. because we had the real demo. Right? That was my backup, just in case it didn't. Just in case. <laughs> That's how much we trust ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so what what can the L compiler do? Um, I've kind of glossed over, you know, at, okay, it takes this model and compiles yep. it, but yep. 
The reason we built a compiler is because compilers can do optimizations. Mm -hmm. right? When you've got the whole model, you can reason about that whole model and, and sort of do global optimizations. And yep. these are some of the things that we can do. Like the first one, obvious one here is fusing linear operations. Mm -hmm. So we can see you know, two linear operations, which is you know, matrix, matrix times a scale plus a bias. Okay. Right? And we can see two of them back to back. Well, you can actually fuse those and turn them into one. Okay. All right, so you just it, eliminated it, a whole mm -hmm. matrix multiplication mm -hmm. by fusing together those mm -hmm. linear ops. You can do uh, switching convolutional implementations. So you talk about convolutional neural networks, but there's half a dozen different algorithms that implement a convolution. Mm -hmm. I won't go into the details of what that is, but there's lots of really good online uh, training about convolutional neural networks. Okay. But the compiler, if since it knows the target device, mm -hmm. We happen to know that Raspberry Pi's profile for convolution is very different from a PC. Mm -hmm. We've run all of these big experiments, yeah. right? And when you say Raspberry Pi, you say actually the CPU yes. powering the Raspberry Pi. Yes, the CPU. You're not talking OS, whatever. You're talking right. what's underneath what the right. hardware, basically. That's right? right. That's right. The hardware, and the you know floating point hardware too, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we've you know when the compiler has this profile information about the different devices, it can actually switch out the implementation of convolution to different algorithms. Yep. Uh, we can also reorder the data. So, you know, if the convolution requires the data in a certain order, we can prepare that and change what the previous layer in the, mm -hmm. in the network is doing. Mm -hmm. So it's all, you know, lined up correctly for the next layer. Yep. Uh, of course, you can, as a compiler, make decisions about multi-threading. Mm -hmm. right? You can choose now, and we can choose, you know, to use all four cores on the Raspberry Pi or not. You can actually, yep. you know, specify that as input to the compiler. Because mm -hmm. uh, maybe you want to fly a drone and you can't use all four cores. Right. You want to use just one core for AI and yeah. the other three to fly the drone? To fly the drone, yeah, yeah. not crash it. Yeah. That's right. Um, I see you have a little drone control down there. So ah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. really nice. One of the toys. That's right. <laughs> this is actually also running a Cortex-M4 chip, the same one as that. Yeah. It's so actually a very so popular... So potentially we're going we're gonna to build a demo. We're going to fly a drone and tell it where to go. That's right. Great. Okay. You going to help me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So lots of other tricks, <coughs> binarization, quantization, and these are all of the researchy things that uh, we're working on in Microsoft Research to improve okay. the compiler. Well, I guess you have papers you were talking about, like training and, and information about that, but there's actually tons of papers that you guys are producing right. and working with that, that people can access as well. Right? That's right, that's right. Do you reference some of them in the ALL projects? Really yes, yes we so? do. Okay. In fact, I'm glad you asked. So this new uh, algorithms from MSR, uh, there's a team in India, MSR India, okay. that are developing fantastic algorithms for really really, really tiny devices, mm -hmm. going all the way down to Cortex-M0, even smaller, you know, Arduino Atmel type 8-bit yep, eight, yep. eight chips mm -hmm. and so on. Yep. They've got these algorithms named Bonsai Proton. You can check out their website here, Fast and They take this model, this mo I got it down to 500K. They took the same thing and they, with their algorithms, retraining, they're able to shrink it down to like 50K. 10 times? 10 times. Right. Now we're talking because now you can do something else yep. and still do the same smart thing on yep. that device. Or maybe we do the AI on this tiny little chip here, you know, instead of the CPU at all. Instead of CPU at all. Yeah. All Anything's right. possible here. So really tiny stuff, really great work. Check that out. Um, yep, yep. We actually have uh, ported their Proton algorithm into the L compiler. Okay. Right. So that's the we'll, we'll suck mm -hmm. in as much of that stuff mm -hmm. as we can and make the compiler smarter and know what these algorithms can do. Okay. So, in conclusion, I think that um, there's a huge opportunity in I, the I industry agree. right now. When you combine AI with devices, mm -hmm. with apps on your phone, mm -hmm. with services in the cloud, mm -hmm. put all that together as a package, huge opportunity yep. right now. Yep. I think, I've been in the industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. I actually think there's more opportunity for developers right now than there ever has been in this space. Nicely done. I like it. And you know, L yeah. I think is is just think of it as it's a low level tool. Mm -hmm. Another thing to stick in your in your workbench. Yeah. You know, when you need to shrink a model down, pull out the compiler, give it a whirl. And yeah, see it like at yeah. use. It's like straightforward, like a couple of, of, of command lines and, yeah. and you get your binaries exported. Yeah. How many platforms does it support today? Well the compiler runs on, like I said, Linux, yeah. Uh, yeah. Windows and, and Mac OS. But the targets yeah. uh, are all of the targets supported by LLVM, which is basically every ARM chip on the planet. Yeah, because you're using and more, the, yeah. right? Smart. Um, all the Qualcomm chipsets. Why in, redo in, the in, work in that someone else has been doing in the open? That's right. Work with them. Yeah. I like that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to have the link to the L project. Mm -hmm. I hope you're going to come back. 
on the show. I would love to. Um, so the link is on the T-shirt here. Oh, yes, right. Uh, we're going to add it to the description. Speaking of T-shirt, I have a gift for you. <laughs> Since you were so nice to me in the video. <laughs> we didn't rehearse any of that, I promise. Here hey, is I the t your own T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. <laughs> love it. I'm going to have to wear it. That's awesome. <laughs> so run AI at the Edge, guys. Uh, go check out the L project. Thanks, Chris, a lot for coming. You're Hope welcome. To see you soon on the show. Yep, thank you. And you guys don't forget to subscribe.